No. Okay. Um. So, right. What I wanted, to, what 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 Ollie was, or what we were going to talk about, <laughs> is poking at compiler internal data. And what this really means is, if you wanted to write a um an extension to Rust C, for example, to do extra static analysis or to look at the code that's being compiled and check for patterns or things like that. Um, we're going to kind of talk through how you're supposed to do that and the patterns for doing that. Now, right now, there aren't any super stable APIs. This all requires using nightly compiler and dealing with occasional changes. But there are better and worse ways to do it and that will give you access to information in a more stable way. Um, so right. Uh, like I said, Ollie's not actually here, but he's becoming a father. Um, I said it a few times, but I had to include this adorable little picture. Uh, <laughs> so you have me instead. Um, and I am, so I've been working on Rust for about 10 years. Uh, and I am the lead of the language design team and had a lot to do with building the compiler and, and have been involved in the project in all kinds of various ways. Um, and I also took over Ali's slides and added a bunch of animated GIFs and planned to show you all his private notes that were to himself because they're really cute and I like them. Uh, so, so about you, the listener, um, I'm imagining that you are not, in fact, here to play Rust the game. I get a lot of requests about Rust the game. I've never played it, but I found out just now today that it's one of the cruelest games. And it looks like Doom with a guitar or a mandolin or something. And so I'm kind of intrigued. But you're probably here because you are interested in Rust code and you want to analyze Rust code. Maybe you are analyzing Rust code. I've talked to a lot of people who've built Rust wrappers of various kinds and kind of didn't know it's not exactly obvious how to do it. And so it, it was very difficult. Uh, and the result was kind of a really hard to maintain code. And so I was hoping that we could have a talk um, that in this talk, people will kind of get the tools for how to build a wrapper around the Rust compiler in the way that it was meant to be done. And then that will kind of be helpful in various ways. Um, so, right. So what I'm going to do is cover a few things. Why would you want to integrate with the compiler? Like, what are some of the things you might do with that? Um, what's the best way? And what might this look like in the future? Oh, and this is one of Ali's notes to himself, uh, which I, it's probably the only one I actually included, but it's so great. So yeah, uh, let me tell, let Ali tell you about his PhD thesis, which is just about that topic. Um, but yeah, you should wait. You could ask him in a few weeks when he's, you know, his life is completely back to normal. It's a little joke for all your parents there. All right. So you might be wondering, why does it matter how you integrate with the compiler anyway? Um, and the answer is you want things to be dry. And by dry, I mean that you should not repeat yourself, or I'm going to ruin the joke, that you don't repeat yourself or that you do not repeat yourself. Right? You want to find ways to, to, to write this uh, without duplicating the logic that's in Rust C in particular or other logic that might be changing. That was my reaction to Ali's joke on this slide. Oh my god. Anyway, so so what are the advantages of of, of doing things the right way in, in a dry way? The main one is that the compiler and your tool will be more in sync, but also you'll leverage the compiler for doing all this annoying work like parsing and type checking. Like certainly it's a lot easier than writing a fresh compiler from scratch. And the last one, the compiler APIs get improved. What what that means is when we have a lot of people building things on the compiler, um, they in turn, I hope, can come and participate in you know Rust as an open source project, participate in the compiler development, and help steer it so that it gets easier and better to use, right? And provide feedback on these APIs. I mean, the APIs didn't start out; they're they're like decent right now, in, in some ways, and not so much in others. Uh, but they they didn't start out as mm, as decent as they are now. They started out much more painful, uh, and they've been shaped by people doing things over the years. And so I'm, I'm pretty excited to see us making progress here. Though I will give a warning that 
right now, this is pretty, a pretty much a secondary use case, right? It's not something we care a lot about when building the compiler. In other words, we're going to land features that change things, and you're going to have to rebase, and that's OK. Uh, but I think over time, there might be room for us to build some sort of, oh, OK, now I'm getting in the future. I'll just wait. So how do you do it? How do you integrate with the compiler? And can the Rust uh, community help you in this? Well, it's easy. You just make a binary crate, that is to say, an application. You call the APIs and report any bugs you find. Yeah, that's it. Um, it's kind of like this. Uh, we can maybe go into a bit more detail. Um, so what we're going to do together is write a little Rust compiler that runs a custom lint and detects comparisons like x equals equals x, which is kind of a pointless comparison, right? And then we can give a nice uh, friendly error message of the kind that Rust is famous for. Like, oh, you can't even see it. What a ruining. Oh, there we go. Something like this, you know, to help people learn how to fix their code. Now, these examples uh, work with this particular version of the Rust compiler. Um, at some point, we'll send out the links to these slides, and you could click through and get the sources. I want to point people to the Rusty dev guide, which, if you don't know it, it's got all kinds of information about how the Rust compiler works, and it's really cool. Um, so the first thing that you want to do is get Rust-C as a library. We don't distribute this by default. You have to add it um, using Rust up component add, and then Rust-C dev and LLVM tools preview. These are two different components. This will install the, uh, the the libraries onto your system. Um, and then you can start to add these things into your crate. Um, and you'll note that you have to have this feature, Rust C private. So the feature gates, if you're not familiar with them, is Rust's way of telling you you're using something for which AV API stability is not guaranteed. Um, and so you, if you upgrade to a new version of Rust C, a new version of Rust, your code may no longer build. Um, and in particular, all of these crates are unstable. Uh, and they probably will remain that way, at least for the time being. So to build your own compiler, you start by declaring a struct. Usually, it's kind of an empty struct, like my callbacks here, and implementing this callback trait. And the callback trait, um, let's see, what goes next? OK. Uh, the callback trait, I feel like there was another slide, but I guess not. The callback trait is, let me just back up then. There we go. The callback trait is a trait that has a bunch of little hooks uh, where Rusty is going to call you at various points in the compilation cycle. Um, so this is what their code's going to look like then. You're going to have a main function that looks, that has a signature somewhat like this. And you're going to collect the arguments. These are the arguments to the compiler, like the command line arguments. Instantiate your callbacks. Oh, there we go. And run Rust C driver, run compiler new with the command line arguments and your callbacks. And yeah, you now have Rust C. Um, the only thing is that this isn't that interesting because you're just reproduced Rust C. You haven't made it do anything different than a normal plain vanilla Rust C. Um, so that's where the callback trait comes in, right? This is where uh, if you want to customize compilation and so forth, you can take a look at this trait. And I know you're interested. Uh, <laughs> this is where it starts to get fun. Um, so you can find, we have actually the, the API docs for Rust C the internal API docs. They're not part of the standard API, but if you go to the Rusty dev guide, you'll find a link to them. And in there, you can find this callback straight, and you can see all the different methods it offers. It basically offers, um, lets you be invoked at various points in the overall compilation process. Uh, and the first method, config, in particular, lets you configure uh, different hooks and things like that that Rusty offers. 
Um, so we're going to look at config for our purposes for building this lint that we're doing. And so we can add the config method. And inside the config method, we get access, mutable access, to the Rust C's configuration. And if we pop up the, the, the Rust doc for what configuration offers, you see it has a whole bunch of stuff. Um, various options, the crate configurations, file loaders. We'll talk about some of these, you know, and so on. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to uh, set this callback called register lints. I don't recall if it was in that slide or not, but anyway, what this is is it's a callback that will get invoked in order to register the lints, like when the compiler's ready to know about what lints are available. And, or rather, sorry, yeah, that's right. It'll get called wit, and it takes, it's a callback, so it's a closure. It takes as argument, this thing ls. I think this is a bug in the slides because I think this ls is lint store. Um, anyway, uh, so these should be the same name, whatever it is. And the lint store is basically some metadata about what lints are registered. And then you can call on the lint store this method register late pass. I'll explain more about register late pass in a second. But basically, you're adding an active lint into the system. And what you return from this closure is the, your lint definition. And my lint is some struct that you've defined. We'll get to that. OK, so what is my lint? Well, every lint in Rust is defined by some type. And usually, it's an empty struct like this because it doesn't have any state to pass in, but it might have some configuration or whatever. And you implement this trait, Rust C lint, lint pass. A lint pass is, is basically when the lint phase of the compiler is running, we're going to call your methods on this trait and say, go ahead and scan the code and, and look for problems. Um, so you can register lint pass, you can give it a name, that'll show up in compiler diagnostics and so on. There's some other methods. And then you can register one of various different kinds of lint passes. The kind we're interested in is the late lint pass. And that means it runs relatively late in the cycle. Uh, whoa. Okay, yeah, there we go. So let me give you a real brief overview of, of Rusty's different intermediate representations and some points in the cycle to explain what late might mean. Um, so when Rust C parses, it starts by reading your Rust sources. It produces an AST, which is an abstract syntax tree. It's actually, uh, anyway, it's sort of more like a concrete syntax tree, but it's, it's really an AST. Um, and it, but it, it, it hews pretty close to what the user actually typed. right? And then we do this macro expansion. And at that point, you actually get kind of what the user wrote, but with macros expanded. Um, and that's the AST. And then there's a lowering step that produces something called here. And here is also an AST, but it's the high level IR. It's not really what the user wrote. It has a bunch of expansions and simplifications. It doesn't have like, um, it has extra data with sometimes instead of storing the path, it'll have the ID of the item that was referenced, or it has like for loops are expanded into uh, while loops, things like that. Some amount of simplifications have been done. And that's what we use for things like type checking and some other operations. And then we lower that into MIR. MIR is basically a control flow graph based code. Uh, it's, it's sort of like JVM analogous to like JVM bytecode is to Java as MIR is to here. Um, so you can still pretty easily recognize the Rust code that produced it, but it's much, much simpler. Um, and that's a lot of static analysis in particular is really interested in Mir because it's a great target. That was kind of what it was designed for. And we do some amount of optimization. This is also the borrow checker runs on Mir, for example. Um, and then LLVM, eventually Mir gets translated to LLVM. This is where monomorphization happens, which means that we generate multiple, for every generic function defined in Mir, we'll make multiple LLVM functions, one for each set of types with which it's instantiated. And I don't know what happens there, a bunch of stuff. Uh, but eventually, it produces some executable. So to bring this back to lints, uh, the reason we have different like late lint pass is basically has to do with which of these IRs you get access to and, and how much data there is. So if you, if you use early lint pass, you can get access to the AST even before macro expansion. 
that can be that can be really useful because you have something much closer to what the user typed. But as a but the consequence is you don't have access to the type like the results of type checking because it hasn't been done. For that, you would have to get the here. And there are ways to kind of connect back and forth between these that I won't go into. Um, but for our purposes, we're going to run on the here. That's probably the best. If you don't know the right end, if you don't need access to the ASD, you should prefer a late lint pass as a rule of thumb. So we're going to implement this late lint pass. One of the methods is called check expert. So this is basically a visitor pattern. It's walking down over all the functions in the crate, and you can kind of interrupt it at any point. And in our case, we're going to, we're going to, um, actually, I don't think you can interrupt it. I don't remember. I don't think you can in this trait, or maybe there's a way, but not with this method. You just get a callback at each point, and we're going to stop it, and we're going to um, look at every expression as we pass by, right? And that's what we're going to put in inside the body here. So this is what an actual lint might look like. That is to say, you would have, eh, how do I go backwards? Oh, OK. You would have this function, and then the body would look like this. Uh, here we're saying, is this a binary? The expression is the, the thing we're visiting right now. We're doing a quick match to say, is it a binary expression? If you recall, we were looking for x equals equals x. So we'll look and see, is this a binary expression? And compare, is the left side uh, the kind, the expression kind, is that equal to the right side? It's not, this isn't really what your code should look like, but it gives you the idea. And, and if it is equal, we'll issue a diagnostic. Um, oops, I thought I had a little more. Let me jump back. So this isn't really what your code would look like because first of all, just comparing things for equality is usually a bad idea. Things get, um, oftentimes things are not literally equal, but they represent semantically the same thing. Like two references to the same variable actually have different spans different locations in the source code stuff like that uh, and there's there's better ways to do it and you can look at like clippy for example if you want to see the this, this lint is an actual clippy lint and there's a better implementation there i also didn't show you how to call diagnostic apis and all the other stuff that's in the um rusty dev guide uh or ping or come on zulip and ask people but but yeah it's really kind of roughly this simple though that you'll get a callback and you'll do some stuff so let's look at some of the other parts of config because there's a lot of really cool stuff you can do. I showed you how you can add a lint pass. I was register lints, but there's all these other, these are like the, the, the big super powerful options that you have. So file loader, Rusty never talks directly to the file system. Instead, it talks to a, v, a virtual file system via this file loader API and you can supply data however you want. Right. Um, so Rusty will basically say, give me the file with this path. And you say, here you go. Here's some bytes. Um, whoa. OK. Uh, let me pop back. The next one is override queries. So override queries is, is really cool. Um, all of Rusty is built on these things called queries. And the basic idea is it's a demand-driven compilation system. So instead of working like a normal compiler where it starts or like a dragon book compiler or something where it's sort of, I will do, in fact, like the diagram I showed you, sort of, I will do parsing, then I will do type checking, then I will do this. What Rusty really does is start from the end and say, what do I want? I want generated code, that's code gen. And then code gen calls methods that it needs like, well, if I'm gonna get generated code, I better have mirror that's been optimized so that I can translate that to LLVM code. Well, to make optimized mirror, what do I need? I need mirror that's been statically analyzed to make static analyze mirror, what do I need? I need mirror that's been constructed. To make mirror, I need here and so on, all the way down to parsing, right? And the reason we do it this way is it allows us to do incremental recompilation. So we cache the results of these queries across compilations. And it might be that instead of re-executing this code, we're just giving you back the, the deserialized result. Um, but what it means to you is in your tool, we allow you to actually take the implementation of one of these kind of like a, OO specialization or subtyping and just swap it for something else, right? And this can totally mess up everything <laughs> if you do this wrong um, because it's, it's on you to call the old one or you know generate the right results. And I think probably if you try to use incremental results that have different definitions of queries, we're not gonna detect that. I don't know exactly what happens. This is, it's too powerful to really be stable but it's the it's the right foundation, perhaps. Um, so this would allow you to do things like hook yourself in, provide 
advice if you think of aspect oriented programming if that's a term that still means anything to anyone uh, around different queries things like that so you might say oh every time mirror gets optimized i'd like to look at it you could do that um so yeah the override queries uh, basically lets you get access to the original query definition you can modify the input output whatever you want to do really cool um here are some queries you might like to look at layout of computes the layout of a type like this field is at this offset in memory optimize mirror optimizes mirror mirror built is accessing mirror before it's even been checked by the borrow checker uh, you could do code gen whoa uh, you know i had edited these slides but i guess it didn't work oh wait i know i didn't reload is that it yes okay wait that's all right we're gonna keep going you missed some really amusing or really improved <laughs> you missed some animated gifs probably is actually what i mean that's okay so uh that's a kind of brief summary of of some of the configuration options that are at your disposal. And I want to talk a little bit now about some examples and ways to integrate. I talked about building your own binary front end um, to do lints. And there are some, another thing you can do is we're, we're building up an interface now that's still in flux, but it's getting better for supplying your own back end. So we have had traditionally the LLVM back end. There's active work on a crane lift based back end, which is this um, compiler that's used started at Mozilla for doing WebAssembly. And uh, there are lots of other interesting potential backends one could imagine. And so that 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 is a very nice place to hook in for certain applications. Um, one thing you'll find is that there's a lot of code that's been like initially everything was written for LLVM and has a, and a lot of it is code you would want to use, but some of it has been factored out into independent utilities and some of it hasn't. So as one very simple example, type layout used to be, we compiled directly from Rust types to LLVM types. And then we added this intermediate layer when we were working on integrating, um, well, for a variety of reasons, but one of them is that like crane lift can now access it and know what the layout of a type is uh, as does, as do other things. So an example would be Miri. Miri is a mirror interpreter. It does a whole bunch of stuff. It's super, you can look up its source and see how to, do how it does all these things, but you know it hooks in after the analysis is done. It finds the start symbol and starts to interpret the mirror, um, and that needs to use things like type layout to figure out, okay, because the mirror will just say, "Give me this field." So it needs to use type layout to find out, well, what is the offset? It's actually s interpreting memory kind of at a byte level. So what is the offset of that field so I can load the memory out of the bytes? This lets it run unsafe code, stuff like that. It's very cool. This is Ali. Ali did a ton of work on this, um, among other people. Crane Lift is an alternative code gen backend uh, that's being developed now, and I mentioned it already. Uh, it's a good thing to look at for if you wanted to swap in a new backend to a new system that's not LLVM. I think that can even be done with dynamic loading. Oh, I'm not that familiar with that system. And the final thing is the community helps. This is meant to be looking forward. What what might things look like in a few, in a little time? And I'm going to go quickly through it. Uh, there's a few initiatives and things that are going on. One of them is uh, libraryification. This links to a blog post I wrote about it. The basic idea of that is we would like to take the compiler and break it up into reusable crates because it's sort of silly for everyone to reimplement the logic. And we're working on that. We've got a few prototypes of things like chalk is a, is a system for doing trait solving. Polonius does the borrow checker. And Rust Analyzer, for example, Rust Analyzer is a the IDE implementation that's most widely used, or one very, I don't know if it's most, but it's one very widely used IDE implementation. Uh, it re-implements a lot of the compiler, but it doesn't have to re-implement trait solving because it can use chalk, which um, uh, is a reusable library. Unfortunately, Rusty doesn't use chalk, at least outside of experimental integration. Not yet, but we're working towards that. Um, but when it does, then it would be you'll have the Rust Analyzer and Rusty both share the same trait solver, um, which would make greater consistency across the user experience. And the goal is to kind of bring more and more parts of the compiler. But the part that I'm personally most uh, excited about and that I think is the furthest along is kind of static analysis, like chalk, like trait checking, the definition of types, the borrow checker. And that, that's definitely active ongoing work right now. Um, 
So besides libraryification, just giving us feedback and, and, and your thoughts and ideas for how we can, or joining us, and I should not say we, because I would like you to be part of the we, how all of us together can build up better APIs um, and, uh, and generally improve this system would be awesome. So in summary, Rusty is a library. It's becoming maybe multiple libraries, but also uh, I hope personally, I wouldn't say this is a consensus amongst the team, but I think it should be that we would like to eventually have some kind of developed and stable-ish APIs. Uh, but in the meantime, you should still use it and it will make your life better if you're trying to analyze Rust code. All right, so th with that, I am finished. We have a few minutes for questions and then uh, we'll go on to talk to the next talk. So people, I'm gonna pull up the chat. I see I have a few missed notifications. Um, oh, sorry about that. Yeah, so feel free to uh, raise your hand or speak. I prefer if people drop something in the chat first, but. Hi, Sasha. <laughs> if you'd like to unmute, go ahead. Um, hello, I don't know if I, yeah. Um, if one was to write a compiler from Rust to something else, basically what I want is a compiler from Mir to something else for static analysis. What would be, so I've explored different approaches already one is using what's developed at Galawa that extracts information from Mir because we are totally developed in OCaml. Another solution is to hook into Rust using uh, callbacks and hopefully find when Mir is uh, being generated and take that into our AST and then write it somewhere, read it with OCaml. What, what would be your approach for that? Um, that sounds like an alternate backend to me, it's so kind of the role of a backend is to translate mirror into something else. Okay, so because I, it wasn't, because there's also something called LIR, right? Or, no. Because, <laughs> no? Not, there's no, okay. d we do sometimes refer to LIR informally, as far as I know, unless I'm out of date, which is possible, there is no LIR formally defined, but what we sometimes call LIR is kind of, mirror itself goes through some internal let's call them phase transitions, okay. like before borrow checking and after borrow checking, and there's some desugaring that happens in, within Mir. And sometimes we use LIR to mean this late stage Mir. Um, cool. But then, okay, yeah, I think, I think writing a backend, back backend is probably where you want to go and that's the right way. Okay, yeah, cool, Daniel. thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, so I have a question about sort of keeping up to date with um, Rust C. So, um, we've been exploring, we've been using this cogen backend way, although not as cleanly done as what you were showing. I'd be interested to um, talk more about how we can do what we're doing more cleanly. But one thing that we see often happens is that things change that sort of break things we're doing. So a recent example is the way that the arguments are passed to closures. It seems that there's like an extra level of tuple being used somewhere. Um, sort of, is there a good way to keep track of and sort of be aware what kinds of changes are gonna happen, both in terms of things that would break that kind of stuff and also in terms of things where maybe the semantics has slightly changed. So the worst case scenario in some ways is that the code keeps working, it keeps linking, but the intended semantics of something has changed slightly. Um. Yeah, I think the answer is no, <laughs> but I, I think we should work to make one. Um, I mean, the best way is to look at the, like we don't, we haven't, care, we don't carefully maintain change logs or anything like that. And I, I think I would like to see us get to a point where we have some notion of stability, or it's not that we don't promise to make changes, but we at least promise to keep a good record of what got changed and maybe bump, bump a Sember number for you or something so you can be aware of it. Um, but we're not there yet and it's gonna take some work to, to make that happen. Uh, in, uh, internally, we have dealt with this problem by often by bringing things 
like Clippy, for example, lives in another repo, but we we build it. We have this notion of tools and tool builders, so that at least when the build changes, we'll notice and refactor. But um, we don't have a way, good mechanism for integrating other projects into that. And that sounds like the problems you're referring to are even a little more subtle. It's not necessarily the build, but some other some other aspect. Um, all right, so I'm going to move on to the next session.